thousands of signatures went to the president and to Congress. Ted got to speak with NASA. It's a group of people that really made a difference in this website. You know, I, I, I allowed people to express their interest. NASA reconsidered. A Pluto mission was on again. A really exciting to me is, you know, knowing that one day I'm going to sit down with one of my kids and be going through a textbook and there'll be all this information on Pluto on there and they'll finally be pictured and also be able to tell them the story of, you know, how I started this little website petition that put together a lot of support and, you know, helped to get this mission off the ground. One of Ted's teachers told him not to bother. Nothing he could do would make a difference. Now, with New Horizons at Cape Canaveral, the 75-year journey from the discovery of Pluto to the first close encounter is becoming a reality. The story of Pluto's discovery begins here, Flagstaff, Arizona, the Lowell Observatory. Named for its founder, Percival Lowell, a rich Bostonian who was fascinated first by the possibility of water and life on Mars, and then by the search for Planet X an undiscovered world out beyond Neptune. Pluto was discovered here, and the observatory remains a center of Pluto research today. Astronomer Mark Bowie personifies the ingenuity and persistence it takes to study Pluto. Part of why I like Pluto so much, because it's a cold, icy place. Bowie's role on New Horizons is to help find targets far out in the Kuiper Belt where the spacecraft will travel after it has flown by Pluto and Charon. This homegrown instrument, named Mimir, after a Norse god of wisdom, will be placed on ground-based telescopes to study ices on Pluto's surface before the spacecraft gets there. Bowie hopes this information can help prepare for that all-important close approach. The better an idea we get about predicting what we're going to see, the better we can tune the experiment and what we do when we get there. We've got one shot, we've got to fly by, we've got to decide, okay, we're going to do this. But you can't say, oh, gee, that's what it looks like, let's try this. You know, it's all going to be what we can guess ahead of time. For two decades, Bowie and colleagues have used the best instruments available to map the planet. In the mid-90s, he and Alan Stern collaborated in using the Hubble Space Telescope to make the first direct images of Pluto's surface. Hubble has revealed the first glimpse of Pluto for the first time. And it's exciting to Mark and I and to our whole scientific team uh, to be able to see this object that no humans really could glimpse as a real planet, as a real object in the solar system previously. In 2002, astronauts placed the new Advanced Camera for Surveys on board Hubble, and Bowie now had data for a new map he created a makeshift supercomputer, which has been humming away for months at Lowell Observatory, finally producing this approximately true color map of Pluto. I, I think this map is probably the best, the best map we're gonna get prior to the spacecraft getting there. Pluto clearly has dramatically varied geology, though the images are still mysterious. But what a transformation from the dot of light that was Clyde Tombaugh's first sight of Pluto three quarters of a century earlier. 75 years to the exact day and time, observatory director Robert Millis shows us how the discovery was made. 75 years ago, Clyde Tombaugh sat at this machine and became the first person to ever see the planet Pluto. The machine is called a blink comparator. Tombaugh used it to look at photographs of the same patch of sky taken a few days apart. Night after night, he'd patiently expose the large glass plates. Day after day, he'd blink the plates back and forth, looking for anything different from the fixed points of starlight. Decades later, Tombaugh still recalled just how uncomfortable and challenging the search for Planet X turned out to be. You get cold, you get numb, because of that perseverance, because this gets brutally monotonous. Blinking back and forward, Tombaugh was looking for anything that shifted position. The only means you have identifying a planet is going to be small, it's like a small star image. 
The only clue you have is shift's position with an interval of a few days in the night's time. That's the only clue you have. So you've got to see all these star images, hundreds of thousands of them, to see if any of them shift position during the interval between the first and second plate. That small movement was just what Tombaugh saw on February 17, 1930. The arrows were added to show its position a few days apart. It was just what Lowell and Tombaugh wanted to see a distant planet. After some debate, an English schoolgirl, 11-year-old Venetia Burney, came up with the name Pluto, god of the underworld. PL, of course, were also Lowell's initials. By studying the motion of that dim and distant dot of light, astronomers discovered a Pluto year, the time it takes to move once around the sun, was equal to 248 Earth years. The angle of its orbit, seen here in silver, was steeper than any other planet. Its distance from the Sun also varied more than any other planet. For 48 years, that was all anyone knew about Pluto. Then, in 1978, astronomers Jim Christie and Bob Harrington analyzed new plates taken at the U.S. Naval Observatory in Flagstaff. Christie noted an elongation of the planet to the north. One month later, the bump had disappeared. Blink the images back and forward, just like Clyde had done, and you see the bump is moving. Their conclusion? Pluto, like Earth, has a moon. Christie suggested the name Charon, after the ferryman of Pluto's underworld in Greek mythology, but preferred to pronounce it Charon more like his wife's name, Charlene. From the motions of Pluto and Charon, astronomers could work out that the moon was almost half the size of its planet, so large that both objects spin around a central point, their mutual center of gravity, outside Pluto. Pluto and Charon were the first binary planet known in our solar system. Using the basic physics of their orbits and their distance from each other, Astronomers were able to calculate their mass and size. Pluto was smaller than our moon, about 1,500 miles in diameter, and had only one-tenth of its mass. Pluto and Charon together would barely stretch across the continental United States. From its size and orbit, astronomers estimated that Pluto is perhaps half rock and half ice. That makes it one of the largest of a whole new class of objects, the ice dwarfs living out in what's known as the Kuiper Belt. This region is named for Gerard Kuiper, a leading mid-20th century planetary astronomer. Kuiper suggested that the solar system didn't end with Neptune and Pluto, but that there should be a disk or belt of other worlds somewhere way out there. In 1992, from a mountaintop in Hawaii, David Jewett and Jane Liu found the first Kuiper Belt object, they were using new and highly sensitive CCDs, like the sensors in a modern digital camera. But their technique was essentially an updated version of Tombaugh's work. Take carefully registered images of a patch of sky and see if anything moves against the distant stars. This one, QB1, did just that. Jewett and Liu had found the first Kuiper Belt object, it was just a few hundred kilometers across, about the size of an asteroid. In 2002, Caltech astronomer Mike Brown and colleagues found a Kuiper Belt object half the size of Pluto. In 2004, Sedna, another world, three quarters the size of Pluto. Brown kept on looking, using computers to do the work of Tombaugh's blink comparator. We do exactly the same thing. Clyde Tombo is the one who, who basically figured out the system for finding these things, but we do it all by computer instead. These are three images in a row that are blinking on the screen, just like Clyde Tombo would blink. On the morning of January 5th, 2005, I was looking at these very images, and I clicked the button saying this one's no good, and I suddenly see this object here uh, very clearly moving across the frame um, in dead center. This, and this is the one where I, I almost literally fell out of my chair because it's perhaps, uh, it's close to being the brightest object we'd ever seen out there. And it's also moving extremely slowly. Slow means it's far away. Slow and bright means it's really big. If you combined 
more distant with anything we'd ever found and almost the brightest thing we'd ever found. You knew immediately that this thing had to be the biggest thing we'd ever found in the outer solar system. The very first thing I did is grab my telephone and called up my wife and I said, I found the 10th planet. 2003 UB313, the random name assigned by Brown's computer was 25% larger than Pluto. Until an official name was chosen, Brown came up with a temporary nickname, commemorating Percival Lowell's search for Planet X. We had actually been reserving the name Xena for the first object that we found larger than Pluto. We wanted something that started with an X for Planet X. We wanted something that was mythological. Um, now Xena is only TV mythology, not real mythology, but we figured Pluto is named after a cartoon dog, so that's okay. Um, and we wanted something that, uh, we, we decided there weren't enough female planets, so we were gonna name another one female planet. So if you take those three together, you get Xena.